call it to order. Welcome to the first meeting of what I've been calling the Act 65 Working Group of the RDAP. Um, we, I, we're gonna, this is another one of those, it's, we're gonna work it out. It's, it's gonna be a little rocky and we unfortunately here do not have the wonderful monitor that we had in White River Junction um, that felt so Star Trek. Um, so we're gonna be a little less polished. Um, I Let's start with introductions. It should be relatively simple. There aren't that many of us tonight. Um, Susana, can we start with you? Hello, buenas tardes, Susana Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Thank you. Monica. Hi, everyone. I'm Monica Weber. I'm the Department of Corrections designee to the RDAP panel. Great. Uh, Rebecca. Hello, everyone uh, from New Hampshire, near Portsmouth, Rebecca Turner uh, for the Office of the Defender General. Thanks. Sheila, uh, Sheila, if you can. Hey, everybody. Sheila Linton, she, her pronouns, um, Community at Large, Root Social Justice Center. Great, thanks. Uh, 802 five oh five nine one four seven which I think is Robin. It is now that everyone in the world knows my home phone number. Um but yes it oh, is Robin. I'm sorry. <laughs> no 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 Aton that was not at you. That was it, it it occurred to me that I just appear as this phone number that now everyone knows um in all of these meetings. <laughs> uh, but yes it's me from Crime Research. Hello everybody. Great. And then eight oh two three I don't know, it keeps moving. Three, four, two, two, four, six, eight. Yeah, just uh, Chris Lewis of Crime Research Group joining you from O'Hare International Airport. Oh, aren't you lucky? Oh, scare. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Great. Uh, Okay, Karen. Hi everyone, Karen Gannett from Crime Research Crime Research Group. Ian. Um, Ian Morris, uh, I'm a from Silver Systems. Great. Uh, Curtis. Uh, Cur Curtis Reed. Ooh, can you shut your? Uh... All right, uh, Curtis Reed, Executive Director of Vermont Partnership for Fairness University. Jessica. Hi, everyone, Jessica Brown, Vermont Law School. David. Hi, hi, everybody. David Scher, Assistant Attorney General representing the AG's office. Great. I'm Eitan Nasred and Longo, he, him pronouns. I'm uh, the chair of the panel. Um, as far as announcements go, I sort of followed what we did last summer. And if you remember, for the working group, which last summer was a subcommittee, um, I don't know if that's an advancement or not. Um, I did not make agenda for every week. Um, I didn't do it tonight. I just felt like if we could be a little less formal, we might benefit from that. Um, I do have stuff in my head, um, and I thought we could go from there. Uh, I will put that in front of you. What I was hoping was we could start off with a discussion of the links to the toolkit for centering racial diversity. 
um, in data integration processes. Um, get some thoughts down on that. You may have them, you may not, you may need more time. Uh, Rebecca brought that to my attention and I'm grateful to her. Um, I feel it felt very much like when Chief Stevens brought his document, if you recall, for our report in 2019 to us. And that really gave us a lot of, uh, of ways to not reinvent the wheel. And I feel like this does as well. So I thought it would be worth our taking a look at it since we really don't have time to reinvent wheels. Um, and get some feedback from folks then I want to turn it over to Rebecca because she's had some really good thoughts about it. With luck, I will be able to share my screen, which will be part of what Rebecca's doing. I'm going to share my screen. I know that seems really boring to you all. I've never done this, so I'm a little apprehensive. Um, and then we do need to revisit and will likely have to revisit many times during the course of the summer um, the idea of the placement of this bureau. So those are the three things I really want to get done. I feel like that's a great start. And after that, next week, we'll be ready to certainly meet with the whole panel. Any objections, any comments? Um, okay, seeing none. Hold forth on the document from the AISP, the, oh God, I can't remember. It's a really good acronym. Um, Rebecca, what does it stand for? I can't. It, sure. Is it at, actionable intelligence or that's social it. policy? I think? Yes. Uh, do, so, that, yeah, do you have it on the screen? Let me pull it up on the screen or uh, on my, I'm gonna pull it up here on my screen. I don't have it up on the screen, no. No, no, we, I didn't mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean for you to share that. Have, has that, has, oh. have others had a chance to take a look at it yet? I don't think, I don't think so. Is, is there a way you can sh share it or email or something with us right now? Yes. Uh, I sent out an email about it last week. Um, I can, I will look for it and send it again and in the meantime i'm going to see if i can put this in the chat a link it's the link that that um Aton sent out yesterday i as I, I just want to get a sense on on this call tonight who has had a chance to to take a look at it karen david Aton. the telephone numbers we can't see your, your hands sir Robin. I have. Uh, Robin, this is Robin. I, I read it before. Yep. Got it. Got it. Sheila? No. No, no problem. I'm just, I'm just trying to get a sense of, of where people are at. Uh, this is Jessica. Jessica. I have not had a chance to look it up. Okay. And the other two on the, uh, I can't see. Um, Curtis okay. hasn't seen it either. Okay. So like maybe, maybe less than half have taken a look at it. Let me let me show you why I, I shared this with, with Aton and thought that it was worth bringing to our subcommittee level discussion. Um, we know uh, we heard we heard Mo at at last month's RDAP. We've been doing this enough. We've heard heard from from our our our, our experts here in Vermont on this stuff. What what I was looking for, I have been trying to find on my own, trying to sort of go down a bunch of different rabbit holes. Um, our, we're, we're toolkit type of things where the, the whole project of data aggregation at the government level, uh, whether or not it was specifically involving the same data we're trying to handle or other bits, um, where that had been done with a racial equity centered lens. Right. So that we were it was it was so we know that Connecticut just recently passed legislation. Right. There's Colorado. I've learned that, you know, Oregon has lots of states have dashboards uh, sharing sort of crime and juvenile court related data. What I was trying to find was something much more specific, and that is approaching the whole build up the design uh, 
with this racial equities lens, right? Not inheriting sort of what's already being necessarily, I mean, with, with the sensitivity of why that was important uh, for us, uh, recognizing that, that we have the luxury of starting from scratch, that the legislature has tasked us specifically and not another panel, but with our specific focus area, right, to, to provide um, some ideas. And so I wondered how that looked different than what could be done without a racial uh, equities lens, right? And so this was something I couldn't find. I mean, this was a pretty, and, and I hope others on the call will share other resources, but this was the only thing I could find. Um, certainly there are lots of groups out there, like Campaign Zero, like from the, from the organizational uh, nonprofit um, criminal reform movement from the community side up outside of government. There was a lot of interesting data aggregation going on, collecting publicly available data, right? Uh, use of force, police violence, how many people have been killed, similar to what the Washington Post has been collecting, for instance, right? Um, there's, 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 of course, uh, the, the dashboard stuff that we see in other various governments. But again, with this, like thinking about it, and so that's where I thought, this toolkit, while not specifically focused on criminal juvenile justice data uh, uh, aggregation, it was an approach that we could implement here um, and at least see a way that keeps us centered and not inadvertently turn the racial equities focus to too late in the end, end point or just simply focused on memberships at whatever part of the governing body, right? Um, and not thinking how that's actually every step of the way. It sort of blew my mind to read about it uh, and how this could be done. But I'm curious what others um, who did get a chance to read it and who, are, who knew this work, or just I, I'm curious what others thought about it. Frankly, I was refreshed. It just felt... <laughs> it felt like it was the right attitude. It felt like it was the right focus. And I think part of why I was refreshed and renewed was back to the same metaphor. Oh, God, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, here are people whose rhetoric looks extraordinarily trustworthy that we can look at and rely upon, in fact, who've done the research. Well, I'll say something. I thought it was a great um, synopsis of all the work that goes into. I don't think it's anything. It's it's interesting. I don't think it's what they did was took all the pieces that we've been talking about and put it in one document where we can follow the roadmap. And I thought they did a really, really good job at at putting that together and showing the complexities and all the pieces that fit together to do just that. Others? We're going to revisit this. <laughs> yeah, I, ap I apologize for not having a chance to look at it before this meeting. I did open it up and, you know, it looks really like it's it's definitely something I want to spend more time looking at. And I, again, I, I haven't had time to fully absorb the information, so I can't really comment on it. I get it. I and I should. I'm. I, I sh don't mean to be shaming people. I was. Trying oh no, to be I don't funny. feel shamed. I just. I just okay. want to acknowledge. It looks like a good piece of information that I do want to look at. I just haven't had a chance to yet. Yeah. Ditto to those comments. Um, <clears throat> I haven't gotten a chance to look through. It looks very interesting to me. And from what I have looked at, just skimming through it a lot, and just from the comments that were made from Rebecca, I really like your framing around this is what I think I heard was sometimes, you know, sometimes there are systems that need to be dismantled and rebuilt. Sometimes there's systems that need to be reformed. And sometimes you just need to really throw the shit out and start all over. And I think we're a little bit more on the spectrum of throwing some stuff out and starting over with a strong base from what we've already currently done and maybe with some tools like these that are uh, coming to our awareness 
to be able to acknowledge that if we are going to really address what we've been talking about is these white supremacy structures and systems and create that racial justice lens that we're talking about, then we may have to start from a different level of the house. And so I'm really appreciative of this and really interested. And it takes me a long time to read. And um, so I'm wondering how thoroughly I'll be able to go through it without spending an enormous amount of time on it. But I like the concept and the framework of doing things differently, not just trying to fit what I think I heard. And Rebecca, please correct me if I'm wrong. But I think I heard was, you know, trying to fit a square into a circle. And like sometimes we try to just what I feel like we might be doing or a piece of what we've been doing is trying to figure out how to do a racial racial analysis, racial equity analysis within the current systems and structures that exist, rather than acknowledging that those systems may be the systems and structures that created, helped to create and, and uphold the systems in which we're trying to dismantle. So again, I just feel like this is great. And I think it's an opportunity for us to be able to do something different. Itan, I wonder if it would be helpful for just five minutes to do a rough sketch of the of sort of a, a little bit of a slightly deeper dive of what are the of the underlying principles and and because that that just does segue into sort of because I, I like what Karen what you said um, that it was familiar right that it was familiar in the sense of all the stuff we've been talking about over uh, the many months that we've been conceptualizing this in bits and pieces, how, how the discussion went last session um, in terms of where, what was critical, where the push and pull were, what, what were the concerns, all of this, like that, that it pulls all of these thoughts together. And, and so I thought um, with that, I, w I was hoping to just outline, because what I had not, and Monica, this, this also hit me, you've been really good about sort of having us be careful with our terminology in terms of data collection, right? Data access, like this, this really set out a sense of, and, and, and it was Wiki, who I don't think is here with us tonight, who talked about not how, yet. huh? Not yet. Um, not yet. Uh, yeah, he talked about how data, quantitative data standing alone can't be expected to tell the story, right? That we need qualitative uh, stories to explain it. Um, and also what hit me home that we haven't really stressed much yet was this central need to make sure we protect the people whose data this is about, right? Like, and, and again, I know that's come up in various ways. Judge Grierson has brought it up in terms of, of you know, privacy, what's confidential, DCF, like this has come up. I think CRG uh, has talked about um, the, the Vermont access laws, right, in public and private. Um, this really brings it, though, centering it to let's remember who we're talking about specifically. We're talking about uh, black and brown and other historically marginalized communities um, whose data, these are the people whose lives are being captured. How are we using that data responsibly to make sure we don't further cause harm, right? So it was interesting to sort of bring back, again, like the full circle of identifying the questions that we want answered versus the sort of open-ended, uh, for me, a nightmare situation would be building essentially a big data government surveillance tool, right? Um, so how to make sure we're not aggregating data that can be used uh, to further harm the very people we're trying to improve uh, their lives and also prevent further inequities, right? Um, so, so I, I thought it was a great summary of it. But again, the data, the data life cycle that they talk about in the introduction, in the um, I'm looking at page four. Uh, you know, there's the planning stage, which I think really is us right now. Um, it's a little bit daunting to read the three pages they summarize of how much is involved in the planning. We're trying to shove some version of it by November one for the legislature. <laughs> uh, but that's a, that was a useful perspective. Then there's there's thinking about data collection, data access. Then there is the algorithms and statistical tools used to handle once you get all the data. Then there's the actual data analysis 
And then there is the reporting and dissemination of that analysis. Um, and so it was an interesting feedback loop all the way, of course, what it, what's then done upon dissemination. And the point there was not just dissemination to policymakers, right, legislators, but to the community, that there was this circle of constant trust building built in of ways for people with lived experience, people from historically marginalized uh, communities, where they can provide input so that there is transparency and accountability, but also trust that this won't be used against them and to actually improve people's lives. And I thought that's where these steps of, of, of the racial equities lens through each of those data, the, the life cycle of data was interesting and useful. We need to dig deeper to see how they suggest doing that. So I think that's, I'll stop with that, Itan. If others want to share thoughts, other thoughts. Sure. So one of the, one of the things that I got, if you got it, okay. So one of the things I think about a lot around data collection is whose data? And are we from the outside collecting data for the sake of our own intellectual curiosity? Uh, and to what extent does community level data that's collected by community members, you know, how do we validate that level of, of um, data collection and analysis. So it's not just this committee or some government entity or nonprofit entity that um, sees as an opportunity to collect data from the people, um, but rather, you know, how do we encourage our communities to collect, uh, analyze and share data that they generate uh, on their own? Yeah, um. Others. Hey, Tom, this is Robin. Can I address Curtis's slide for a second? Please do. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I'm on an actual phone, so I can't raise my hand properly. Um, when I, so to Curtis's point about um, community members and community organizations, um, I will tell you that in my years of advising community organizations about how to collect data, um, they need money uh, to do it. Um, they need technical assistance. They need a streamlined process um, because data collection isn't their, you know, main goal. They're service providers for the most part. It's what I've, what the people that I've, I've helped. Um, but this government needs to help them with, with resources um, to be able to be some of those frontline collectors. So if you take, for example, the Network for Domestic and Sexual Violence, they ha there's a open source case management program um, for their grant reporting that you know was very helpful in being able to get everyone to report their grants. But now we also have that data from them about how many victims they serve, et cetera, et cetera. So capturing a, a you know a portion of the population that may not ever see government in, in, you know interaction because they're not reporting to the police. Likewise. For organizations um, that work with marginalized communities, um, you want to, to encourage with funding to have um, people be able to collect that data because um, they're seeing people who will not interact or show up in the data uh, on the government side, and their stories are different, um, and their stories need to have the same weight as those who interact with the government. And that's my soapbox. So the, I'm going to drill further down into my question, which is who gets to determine what questions are asked? The current model is that someone exterior to a community decides what questions they want to ask, and then they try to figure out a way, you know, what's the best way to collect this data that has been um, determined by a, another party. So how do we get communities themselves to generate the questions that are important to those communities uh, and then equip them with the tools and the resources and the infrastructure to actually go about doing that? 
because right now communities are responding to questions that are generated by a second party. Hey, Tan, I have a, I have a thought. Uh, I was I muted. Sorry, Rebecca. I called. Yeah, go ahead. No, it's. I mean, Curtis, you're you're absolutely right. The outsider status, right? Uh, Mo Mo talked about. We've talked about. We've struggled with. Leg legislature wanted to turn RDAP into the effective governing body, right? Of this of this entity. I think I think an important uh, consideration. I think. For us to consider to think about, but I think the answer is there, is get these community members, these people with lived experiences, uh, the advocates for people who are who have these um, lived experiences, get them to elevate them to be core stakeholders, make them bring them to the the table uh, in the in the in the governing body, build in um, some organizational structures in terms of how we suggest how this governing body develops the questions that need to be asked to then task it out um, and, and build into that some requirement that there be additional outreach right to the communities because we can't expect uh, people to come find right we the governing body should be a built up of memberships of those key communities and voices um, and then have a requirement to additionally go out and search and find um, ways to get the, the input. Monica. Thanks, Eitan. And I, I don't think I'm specifically um, responding to Curtis's um, question, although I think that some of the work that we have to do needs to keep all of that in mind. Um, but I was looking, I, I'm trying to skim the toolkit really fast. I will read it, but I'm, I'm skimming it while we're on the call. And, and you know, I really like these pages, the positive practice versus problematic practice um, in each of these areas. And it, and it occurred to me, one thing I would do is sort of look at those practices and also sort of map them against the, the work that we have to do, right? So in terms of like, to how and to what extent the Bureau should be staffed and the scope of the Bureau's mission, and then pulling the promising practices from this toolkit and making sure we avoid the problematic practices could be a way for us to sort of, could help us guide answering the questions that are posed in Act 65 um, so that we know that we're not sort of running afoul of, of what you know um, AISP has done. That was just an idea I'm thinking about, but I need to sort of play with it a little bit more because I think it could help sort of us walk us through some steps in each one of these areas that we need to figure out. It's my unformed just, thought uh, of the moment. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> just to quickly piggyback on Monica's point, because I'm doing the same thing she's doing, which is skimming the the toolkit, and uh, I think I'm on page 25, and there's a page with the exact type of chart that she's talking about <clears throat> with positive practices and problematic practices, and one of the positive practices uh, is, for example, open data that have been identified as valuable through engagement with individuals represented within the data. So I do think that <clears throat> this can be a really good source of information and guidance for all the concerns that we are raising right now. Thank you. I just want to also point out, um, and this sort of came up at our last meeting too, um, a lot, it feels like there's a lot of work we have done. We did say there should be a governing body made up of community members that should be advising this thing. That was in the report that we submitted in December of last year. That was a big part of that report. Um, likewise, a, there was a lot of data in there that we were looking at that, I mean, you remember, we spent an, a, a huge amount of time looking at what data did we feel was ne were, were needed, um, what existed. I mean, 
CRG did yeoman's work in figuring out what was where. Um, that data is not generated by the community, but I don't think that that means it's not useful. It's useful in a particular way, but not universally useful. Um, but I just wanted to point out, um, there's a lot we did do. It's, it's not like the governing body has, and I'm also not entirely certain, and I think this may be an, an open discussion, how much more clear does that need to be made to, this sounds so snitty, how much clearer does that need to be made to the legislature? We said a governing, I mean, do we have to make up the governing body? I, I believe they want us to make up, they want us to answer or suggest a lot of answers to their questions, right? Who's on the governing body? Where are the bureaus should be housed? They, they, yes. Does that seem like maybe what we want to yeah. have happen? No, but that's what they told us to do. <laughs> you know, well, there I, it is, my thanks. <laughs> that's a, it is over there. It is what they asked us to do. <laughs> For, for those of you guys who have that toolkit up, page 34, if you keep working your way down through it, is the beginning section on a toolkit activity one, who should be at the table. Um, now, this process of identifying who should be at the table, uh, let's, let's not worry about the timeline or budget. <laughs> We don't need to dwell on, on those pressure points already. Um, uh, they're not, I'm not minimizing, though, all of those excellent points on how, how you build in accessibility and um, openness uh, for a diverse set of, of members, so I don't mean to do that. But if you go to 36, um, for purposes of sort of answering that question or thinking about how, to, how we can go about answering it, they provide some suggestions on how to identify your stakeholders, who, who are core stakeholders. And I thought it was interesting um, how they, how they lock, talk about it there. Um, basically, it's, it's those who could, uh, who you need um, and who would seriously impede <laughs> the whole project, right? Who needs to be at the table? So I think, we know like the government stakeholders who's who who has the data, right? Um, and 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 basically almost all the represent represented organizations here at an RDAP, um, government agencies, departments. Um, it's the others, and we we've talked about community members. We've talked about people with lived experiences uh, being in here. Uh, we've talked about technical experts, right? Technical experts expanded upon here beyond just data technology, like DDI, um, research, CRG, you guys, right, are, 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 are part of, of this sort of others who can facilitate and make better. Uh, UVM, we've, we've identified legal. We haven't really thought about who provides the legal expertise. We sort of inferred, I mean, so do we want, basically it's interesting to think about who should be on and what do they bring to the table and and what do, so not just identifying sort of your place but what skills what expertise do we want to make sure we have as well um i thought that was interesting helpful you Rebecca, do you want me to attempt to put up the the drawing? If others, if others are willing to to keep listening, although I really hate, I mean, I want people to jump in, but, but because I, I have had sort of the advantage of a finding this and reading this and thinking about it ahead, <laughs> I want to I want to share what. Yeah, I think maybe Tan. Like I sort of, I, I sketched out from, you remember Coach sketched out something when he talked about this at, at the legislature in terms of thinking about how this could be designed and where we have sort of talked about it 
um, I started, and, and then how, how I read this toolkit, um, and then looking further into how others have been doing this, uh, Iowa was an example in this, uh, this AISP um, website on racial equities that had recently tried to implement something like this. So I've been trying to sort of pull things together to do a diagram, and, and that's what Aton's think, talking about. I think, yeah, I'm happy to, to, to sort of, to walk through with people. I don't think it's anything radical. I think you guys will think it's pretty familiar. Um, so how, how, again, uh, grounding us with some way to conceptualize moving forward and, and maybe thinking about how we wanna break down steps um, and dive deeper into the details. But, uh, Eitan, do you I, have? I, I, I do, I'm doing the best I can, which of course means nothing. Um, I. I clicked that little upright arrow next to leave, and I've got the purple circle of death going around in a circle. Um, and it doesn't seem to be sharing anything. Um, I'm trying to see if I can share, but I'm not seeing how I can share from here. Oh, I, 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 I can share, actually. You can share? I think so, let me see. That's more than I can do. All right, let me let me let me see if I can pull this up. God forbid Microsoft should make something easy to use. Share content. David, do you have a sense of who who? Maybe I am not the. Sh I, I don't have sharing so ability. <clears throat> annoyingly, sometimes. Oh, perfect. I think I got well, it. That's not a sharing ability. It, it's it okay. Didn't I had like fifty plus screens up. <laughs> okay, so um, so so this was again. Um, I, I wish we could have a placeholder. What we want to call it. But remember, there was this thinking of there would be a, a director, an executive director, and two staff people, I think, uh, data experts. So that is conceptualized here in the center circle. Uh, I forget, someone named it the Bureau. Uh, that sounds very federal. Eric Fitzpatrick did that. Yeah. yeah I, that, right. I was like, it's a statute, but whatever. We can change the name. Statute, but I, I think <laughs> here, uh, being part of uh, hearing them, that, they, that he threw it in as a placeholder. Uh, I didn't get the sense, maybe others would disagree, but that that was locked in. Um, so that's that's that. But instead of it being, I mean, in a way it's the hub, right? But it takes its direction from the governing board. Um, so it's not the one deciding which questions to ask. It's not the ones um, asking which government agencies to ask, right? Like this is coming from, what the governing board decides to do is the question to be asked, uh, and then who should be on the governing board was that separate question we were sort of diving into. What I did here was separate. We've only talked about a single governing board, um, and I know there have also been uh, concerns, both in the legislature, how like why just build this for criminal juvenile justice and race? Can't the same issue and uh, and need is being identified in health and education? Like, and Evans brought this up. Like, whatever we design, we should do something to scale up. Here is an example of a scale up. Uh, you set up a governing board based on the subject area that you're trying to be aggregating data on. So, let's not give short shrift. They're very different. Um, the two systems, right? We talk about how we still, we never spend enough time on the juvenile justice side of the house, right? It's sort of a short trip, but that's an easy fix. You elevate it. There are different stakeholders, over, overlapping related but specific needs, right? So why not have a separate governing board related to juvenile justice? Uh, why not have a separate separate governing board for the criminal justice folks? Um, I don't know. Again, hey, then- Rebecca, could you email that to Robin? Because she's on the phone and can't see this. Oh, shoot. Yes. Um, I'm Thank sorry, you. Robin. Eitan, do you still have that copy that you can send her so I can keep talking? I, don't I think can. I can. I, yes. Uh, and you can um, send it to her. Um, 
else on this call. Thanks. I don't think. Um, and then there's there's this circle which you guys can see and um, not everyone. Sorry, Robin. <laughs> The uh, where it, it's including smaller circles of all of the um, agencies, departments, which would be the data holders who who have the data that would need to be provided for to be collected, to be then uh, analyzed and then reported out. And so that instead of, you know, I know we've seen uh, mappings of it where we pull them all out. Right. But let's like group that group as like the place where the data is coming from. And in a way, even though there's one arrow going towards back to the division, um, because they're sending out the data, in a way that's where these two groups will be like interacting with each other to make sure that the data exchange, um, the sharing satisfies legal requirements and also the needs of the actual data that we want to collect, right? Um, so there's that back and forth there. Then we talked about who's doing the analysis, uh, the, who's doing the applying the algorithms, right? Who's, who's going to actually put all the stuff together and get the quantitative? I guess there, there, that's a lot of different parts, but um, that's where I started thinking of, of where the role of CRG, UVM, um, others, right? Who we can bring in to, to, um, to sort of, again, be the be the experts to to uh, do it. There is sort of then um, some transparency built in, maybe checks and balances, right? Like how many people, how many different people, how many different entities within that separate outside analytical circle. Something where whatever is decided is appropriate there satisfies again sort of this overarching need for transparency, accountability, and looping back, confirming that. The core principles of what's guiding all of this are being um, met, um, and so that's that was a start. It's 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 not. It's just it's just. Uh, so I don't know what others think. Um, alternatives. I like that it's scalable. I'm going to stop. I mean, the that... oh. oh, okay. <laughs> So we can see each other, or do you want me to keep this up? It's up to you, or the board, or, or whoever we are. <laughs> the work, we're the working group, right? Isn't that working what we are? group, right? We're the yes. working group. Um, I, th you know, Rebecca, I think that that like structure make makes sense. I think one of the fundamental questions that still isn't answered, and maybe that's where we need to, you know, we obviously need to have a question: is where does that division as you as you named it um live you know and on one hand the way it's kind of set up it's almost like it's its own you know organization unto itself with different sort of advisory panels um but i don't know if you gave if you thought any more about that or um because i think that is one of the things we have to to answer in our in our report right no, and you know, to me, that's like incorporating. Remember Pepper collecting all of our thoughts. Is Pepper on this call? I thought I saw him briefly. I saw his face there. I, I, I saw him. <laughs> <Pepper's. laughs> yeah. that Anyways, that's, right, that's the Secretary of State, auditors, uh, right, HRC, right, right. Uh, or ideas, and others. Uh, independent, another just an independent entity, and then of course, um, Susanna, uh, in in within your uh, office was also uh, a suggestion. I have thought a lot about. It. I don't know what if, where others are on this question. I think fundamentally, they let's forget where within government we should rest on, settle on. Do we want government, or do we do we want something within government or outside? If it's within government, where should it be? Should it uh, presumably executive branch if it's government? But then, so um, and I think that part of the one thing that may help us, and I think your uh, chart visualize that is um you know the separation between the actual aggregation and collecting of the data although i understand sort of from you know other conversations that we still need to be pretty mindful about that in terms of how how it's done and the analysis piece 
and who has access to to the data and analyzing it. And I feel like that's an, something interesting that we should continue to explore because I think it could help us land a little bit e more easily on where a division that aggregates what's going to be primarily, in this case, government data is, is housed. Government's going to have to be involved in some way, so what's the, what's the best way um, for us to, to do that? I remember there was a time about eight weeks ago where I was sort of accessing my inner Rosa Luxemburg, and I was like, smash the state. This should be completely outside of it and, you know, go anarchy. And I was having a really great moment. And then I thought, but I work for the government, and I had a moment of, and who's going to sign the requisition for a computer? And who is going to tell the director of the bureau, um, oh, thank you for letting me know you need the next two weeks off and that that's covered under vacation for you and you get paid. Or there are suddenly all these like fundamental basic employment questions that I'm going to be honest, I don't want to answer. I don't want to answer. That's just me. I'm not speaking as the chair. I'm speaking as Aton. I don't want to answer those. That's the beauty of putting it somewhere within state government where it feels at least relatively protected because I don't know how to figure that stuff out. I, requisitioning a computer, I don't know. I go to Staples. Fill out you know, a form and give right? it to your yeah. IT manager. <laughs> A what? I mean, yeah, right. I mean, you know, it, and there's just something, I, I think that that has to be balanced here is, um, I mean, it's funny on one level, but on a real level, it's time, it's labor. Um, and the whole idea of making it diffuse, though, there are moments when I just want to like, get a small nuclear weapon and bring it to Montpelier. I shouldn't be admitting that, but um, the reality is that all that diffuseness actually facilitates when it's working well, acquisitioning a computer, um, making sure there are data sharing agreements, all of that stuff is already taken care of. And so I'm just throwing that out there too, that it's something to bear in mind, I think. Something that I've, that has been shared with me is also having a strong arm ability to have the data collection happen, right? Um, that, that, that we make sure that that whoever is charged with, with running that division is someone who can essentially order or require uh, the, these various government departments and agencies to comply, right? Um, we've talked about building in sort of consequences for individual departments and agencies if they don't, um, don't provide the data. And that's always possible for sure. Uh, but I too, like I, I am, I am, I'm for what it's worth, and I'm curious to hear what others think, more and more settled that whatever wherever and whoever is, is a new ent government entity or not, that it should be within state government uh, and within the executive branch. Um, one more thought before I want to hear, I, I want to hear others, but I had a random encounter with um, the Secretary of State Jim Condos at the dump yesterday. <laughs> we were at the garbage uh, in Montpelier, and I, I asked him if he was aware that, that we had been recommending this, the Secretary of State <laughs> As, as a possible placeholder place for this. Um, and he had, he had a few immediate thoughts, reactions. A, the conception of what work is involved, how much data aggregation necessarily requires that the entity has significant infrastructure. Um, and he also said, was he, he neither committed uh, or rejected the idea, right? That was not, I mean, that isn't the, the point. He also 
put on my radar two people that we should consider talking with. Um, Tanya, oh, I forget her name from, from head of archives and then uh, the deputy, uh, and I'm forgetting his name, but also put on my radar. I didn't realize that the legislature had tasked the secretary of state to start collecting new data on a new law that passed the session related to uh, BIPOC business owners. So they are right now trying to design a similar new data collection point on how to do this. Um, so I thought, oh gosh, well, here we have, we're all siloed in our projects, a potential piece for some depth. Um, okay, so total out of the box thinking here. There are a couple of um, uh, sort of equity investment firms. I think we could move this idea into the private sector, um, and you know, getting a couple of Vermont uh, equity firms that would uh, underwrite all of this over a and you know, make the pitch that it happens for over the, a period of 15 years that they underwrite the cost of this massive uh, data infrastructure. Uh, so anyway, that's my my two cents. Uh, it doesn't need to be government, but if we go outside of government, we're gonna need big bucks and some of Vermont's equity um, management firms can do this with, you know, at, it'd be a drop in the bucket in terms of their their um, net worth. Can you get names for us? Sure, I'll, 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 I'll send you some names. Um, but yes, uh, I would, um, I'm just trying to, uh, sorry, hello everyone, my name is Weichi. Um, I, um, from uh, just after having read the report that you sent us, Eitan, um, I'm just thinking about like risks, right? Um, and I think wherever we decide to put it, there are risks. So I just want to think about what is the risk of putting it, of putting this in the hands of a private firm. And I'm automatically thinking is like we are giving individual data for a private firm to aggregate for us. And I think that's I think about, you know, um, what the private industry has done uh, for with data in our individual data, right? I think about a Cambridge Analytica. That is a lot bigger scale, right? It's not an equity firm. It's like a different, it's a, it's a different, you know, thing. But just really thinking about what it means um, to for us as a, a government group to hand over our citizen data over to the private industry. Nothing. Right, and you know the 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 model assumes that there's a that the structure is such that it will it opens this up for the exploitation of of data but if this entity is is governed by community members and managed by community members there's much less chance of of um, the kind of nefarious uh, activities uh, to go on, um, it's a uh, like it's it, it's a I don't want to say pie in the sky idea, but it is one way to pull this out of the politicization of data when it's in the hands of government. You know, we should throw out there on the table as well as 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 that we've talked about academic institutions as well. Uh, I think I, I, there's also, I think people have talked about CRG. Um, and I think fundamentally, 
we want to make sure there is trust. I appreciate the, the, the highlighting critically of the privacy interest and being at the forefront and, and how we can make sure um, that the data will be used responsibly and protectively, right? Narrowly, not be sold, not be lost, not be compromised. Uh, again, it was it was conversation that Jim uh, Condos brought up, reminding me about how they had to scramble after the DMV uh, mix up of two weeks worth of data sharing relating to non-citizen information, how they had to scramble back and crawl in. And it was just, again, a, a useful reminder of how the Secretary of State has already, um, I mean, they're, it's built into their system in terms of thinking about how to protect data privacies. They've just gone through, I'm not trying to sell them. And what I'm actually thinking is, I'd love to find out who we can talk to, the people there, to learn from them and from they might have names, organizations, ideas um, on, on what we should be thinking about. In terms of specifically, like we're thinking about steer us away from private or to consider it, right? Who do they use or, or private uh, the academia um, or, or government. Um, RDAP, we've all talked about how important independence is, transparency, accountability. Um, for me, this this gap isn't so wide if we turn and start this within government, state government, because there doesn't seem to be an obvious alternative right now in terms of having that level of of, of trust. Um, I'm increasingly, uh, and I, you know, I'm increasingly going towards thinking of of creating a new entity within executive um, that would just be this sort of new data body. But again. Um, I'm open. Wiki, do you have any uh, suggestions or ideas on, in terms of, or others, you know, in terms of privacy protections, governance, and considerations? Like, what what do you think about? I mean, I know there are individual laws in Vermont. What's public? What's private? But are there are there other resources that we can look at to quickly get our heads around all the various things we should be thinking about? Um, from our perspective vantage point coming at this? I, I think in 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 my own opinion, I, I have sort sort of several responses to that. I think one um, privacy, privacy laws and data governance, that's like God, that's a can of worms. Um, and uh, it's different for every industry. Um, I would, I am not an expert in government operations. Um, I've done data governance in healthcare, but not in, in government operations. So I can't speak on that, uh, but I'm sure that we can bring in an expert to talk about that a little bit. My, uh, my other response to this is when I've seen successful sort of data analytics houses, I've seen them embedded within the IT, um, uh, department specifically because when we talk about data we we have to talk a lot about um, availability of uh, techn technological resources we need to talk about um, us we need to talk about um, what's the word I'm looking for for here, conformance, like, because we're not going to be the only people that are going to be asking for data. Um, so we need a central place in the government where we can be able to pull. It's like, oh, they've already laid out this foundation, so we can build this on top of it. And we need that type of that that specific type of governance. We need to be able to have. We can't be siloed, or we're going to spend years and years and years building things that we never end up using. Um, I also I also do really think about. Um, really housing this in a place where it's not governed, it's the people that are, that it's supposed to be changing, that it's not being housed under, under them, right? Like we can't, we can't be like, hey, um, you know, I'm just, just, uh, this is out of my brain, uh, police department, we need you to be accountable. Here's data and like govern the data so you can be accountable because then all of a sudden it's a, uh, oh, let me tailor that data. So it's showing that we're accountable. So by putting it in a department like IT or something like that, where it's apart from, a, like a specific place, like a specific, uh, you know, like 
instead of the Secretary of State or something, you allow for that accountability to be a little more um, transparent and checks and balances. And Witchy, I know you joined us um, fairly recently. I just wanted to let you know, and I'm not sure, I think everybody else knows that Robin, who's on the phone here with us now, is really an expert in Vermont criminal justice data. We have our hands on a lot of data in the state. So we really, and we have contracts with the state. So just, just so you know that there, there are people here that have a handle on that data. And as this is Robin, I'll say I totally agreed with everything that what you said. Um, and would add also, um, and Eitan did send me the, uh, uh, the diagram. Uh, I would in the circle that actually you have uh, CRG and UVM, I would add um, others that we don't know who they are yet. Um, and I just want to point out that research dollars and access to data is as competitive and is um, tainted by the same white supremacy structures that exist, right? Um, so UVM and, and, and I, we can compete. Um, UVM has more resources, so they can do, you know, some competition better uh, for, for research dollars. We, uh, for example, just did our privacy certificates with the state, the attachment D, which is this horrible thing that we have to sign and, and, and have all our policies. It's a burden for a small organization. But if this is housed, as would you suggest, in AD, what would be ADS, CIT, then they can release these de-identified data sets and independent scholars, scholars of color, scholars that, you know, we don't know who they are here in Vermont um, can access that data without those burdens of the privacy and, and, the, and the confidentiality that, um, that we all have to go through. So I just want to point that out that the analysis um, should also um, be centered in trying to encourage more voices and more scholars, and, and particularly scholars of color, uh, to engage in the analysis and make it as easy as possible for them to do so. Robin, I know how much you hate repeating yourself. Yes. But I'm going to say, through this summer and fall, I think you should probably remind us of what you've just said, because it seems to me that that is the sort of thing that needs to go into draft legislation, and we are okay. charged with that. Well, that's my suggestion. I don't know if you all agree with that, but that's just my suggestion. No, <laughs> but you should keep repeating it because we should keep thinking about that. That's important. I mean, if we're taking what Curtis said seriously, um, there are analysts who are not government actors. <laughs> Surprisingly, I think that it's it is it's absolutely critical. We think about how ADS fits in to this design. I will share that I am loath to default to ADS as the housing body for again what's called there the division, um, and I say that because of what a radical redoing we are of this. Right, we are not needing someone. Uh, and, and again, I'm I, I'm not saying that ADS shouldn't be involved in this. They're I think they're a core stakeholder, right? They're a, they're a stakeholder. They're they're just they're they're critical to to because they could we need them. But should they be the centralized uh, entity, the body? Do they come at it uh, structurally, organizationally, uh, in the same way that we want and envision? The organization of this division, right? Um, it's so much bigger than the technical how to's. And I mean that with all due respect of how complicated that is, right? And, and how much it is to, to protect and, 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 and aggregate and, and ensure that the privacy protections. I, I, I don't minimize that. I do recognize that historically, they are not area expertise in law in the criminal or juvenile court systems. They're not area expertise in racial justice issues generally, racial inequities issues generally, right? Uh, representing the interests of people from historically marginalized communities. 
they do work for state government. It's, it's, it would be a thumb on the scale in a way that already I think is working within the old ways of doing data that I don't think sends the right, uh, the right message. If, if, if someone has a way or ideas of how to kind of address my, those kinds of concerns and working and building a more central role of ADS, I welcome, and, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, shutting that out as a possibility. I just am extraordinarily skeptical that ADS should be such a central, uh, play such a central role in that sort of division side, side of things. Rebecca, would it be a good thing for me to try to get Kristen McClure to come to one of our meetings to address this? Who's Kristen McClure, the head of, um, She's sorry, the head of ADS. Yes, although again, I think we should get someone uh, from the Secretary of State's office, whether it's Tanya or others, like to figure out how they do it. Like they don't, do they aggregate all their data through uh, ADS? I don't think they do. I don't, I, I, I'm pretty sure, but again, we should, why don't they? Like that's, these are all questions. What have they not, is it because they haven't considered it? Is it because they have considered it, but they have concerns? What, what is the role that ADS plays with what kind of massive data that Secretary of State's office is processing um, and reporting out and protecting? I think they provide, I think the most useful uh, place for us to look uh, in terms of thinking about how we should structure this new division, this entity. I, I think it's, um, I think it's healthy for you to have that skepticism. Um, I would, I wouldn't necessarily be like, hey, ADS or IS department, here's the thing that we need build now, build it. Um, it, especially like around data infrastructure. So um, for example, like when I go in, cause I'm a data architect, so I would like, my job is to design these kinds of systems. I would never consider myself the subject matter expert in the data that's happening. I would consider myself in the subject matter expert and being able to, to talk to the business leaders to be able to develop what it is that they need to better make their own decisions. Um, so that's so that I would never expect um, the uh, the ADS to develop this in silo on their own without the specific guidance of like the people who actually know criminal justice and actually know what it is that we need to decide here. Um, yeah, that needs to happen. Absolutely. I do also think that uh, I agree with you that it would be really interesting to see what the Secretary of State has, um, like, cause, because they've already done this, like, have they reached out to the ADS, like you're saying, like, what are the risks and pitfalls and assumptions that we're not, that we're, I'm not necessarily seeing here that they've probably dealt with? Anyone else? Susanna, if you're talking, I see your lips moving. Inside thoughts are in response to everything that we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Actually, well, while we're here, I, I will say that um, I agree with a lot of what's, of what's being said we have to think about the risks of the hands into which we're putting these tasks and these data. And um, I don't think any of us wants to be skeptical or, or unsure about our, our colleagues around government. But, um, but I think anything that's intended to serve as a watchdog function should be scrutinized in this way. So, um, so there's that. I also agree with the statement that this is going to require significant infrastructure. And if we're going to do this, let's do it correctly because like what you said, we don't want to spend years building something that we end up not using because we say, well, it took us three years and it's not even serving all of the needs that we needed to. Um, that said, I, I'm not, I'm not certain where, where it should sit. Uh, I know you all have been having this conversation for a long time now, and um, I don't really know that there's a clean answer for it. It feels more stable, especially economically to put it in the executive branch um, because it's there, it's visible, it must be budgeted for, et cetera. And yet again, um, you know, do we ask people to govern themselves 
and the data against which they're measured. So I just did a lot of talking. I don't have any answers, but it's all kind of churning in my mind what you all are saying. I also, and I'm just going to point this out now, I'm looking directly at Act 65. Um, let's keep talking the way we are, but I'm going to do what I did last summer, which is these are the questions they've asked. These are the questions we're answering. That's it. Um, because I think already I know where we're going to go. <laughs> we're going to... We could go way into the weeds on this and get into really great ethics conversations. Um, but there's a report. There are very specific questions. There are five. And at our last meeting, I talked about this group answering three, one through three. And then the last two, you'll remember Mo Stein was talking about getting all the serious data, you know, rocket scientists together, which I think, Witchy, that includes you, um, and getting them all to sit down and have that really cool conversation that I won't understand at all. Um, and I think, Witchy, you would be really important in that because you also have the social justice side of this. Um, and you may be able to catch something in all of the jargon that gets thrown out that I'm going to really miss. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to say, continue looking back at Act 65. It is on page 20. Um, it's really quite clear what this report is supposed to answer. And I think it's important to stay there. You'll remember last summer we started getting, we, we, oh Lord, I don't even want to remember that. It gives me hives. But we, we like went, we went way, way out into some really interesting stuff. And you'll remember all of a sudden it was like, yeah, no, no. Here are the questions. Answer the questions. That's it. This is like a term paper. It is not a dissertation. Um, so I just would, I would encourage you, all of us, to look again at um, the act as enacted and make sure that we're answering those questions. This process is already underway. We're not coming into this at the ground floor. Hey, Tom, in the chat, people have been helpfully uh, pulling those questions out. Um, and oh, how you. nice. I know. Look, Thank there's chapter. Look at that. Witchy even asked that. Uh, sure, Witchy, I can. Well, and David sent you the link. I'm going to just stop now because everybody else is like handling it. It's cool. Yeah, it's great to get to keep us focused on these critical questions. I, I do think that a lot of the discussion tonight is, is surrounding that and sort of reminding us of where where we we have answered these questions, um, how do you? So we have we're meeting weekly, which is an incredible amount of time for everyone. Um, how do you suggest we we go about this then, in terms of these? Uh, personally, I think everyone should look at the report that we put out. That we should get a good handle on, and I can resend that out. Uh, tomorrow morning, I can look for it again and send it out and ask that people look at it between now and next Monday. Um, and I would recommend that it be looked at with these questions that are in the chat in mind. Um, certainly the first three, um, which is what we were talking about, this group answering how the Bureau should conduct data collection analysis. That was something you'll remember. Um, this was a, this was sort of a, 
awkward moment when coach put this in and you'll remember that because we were all sitting here going um we threw this to you all you're the lawmakers we're not experts on this we told you this needed to be done that was our job we said this needs to happen and it somehow is magically back in part of Act 65 a year later, how the Bureau should conduct data collection analysis. The only difference is we actually are working with experts now who can take a stab at answering that. I have no idea how long that will take. Similarly, question five, the best methods for the Bureau to enforce its data collection and analysis responsibilities. That's something that Tyler Allen has been asking. That is something that Chief Stevens has been asking since God was young. Um, and I think that we should look at that report with reference to these specific questions and really focus our thinking. Does that sound like a plan? You. Oh, hold on, Curtis, I've got to mute myself. Go. All right. Um, you know, when I see the questions, the most critical question is not there, which is how much is all this going to cost? You know, there's, you know, the legislature is great at asking for recommendations, but then there are no dollar figures next to them. Um, or they set no sort of parameters in terms of cost. I think it would be innovative to step up and say, here are your answer to the five questions, and this is how much it will cost to implement those, and to implement those in a way that we would feel satisfied. So, uh, Karen, since you were in this business, Yes, Curtis. You know, to build out an entire system to do what it is that we've been talking about in the ether world, what figure would you put on that? Given that you won't build it up over the course of a year, but it will take three to five years to really build it up and then moving forward. You know, I'm not going to answer that right now. But I will talk with Robin and maybe with Witchy, and we'll come up with some kind of ballpark. Um, I think that's the best way to do it. Because off the top of my head, it's it's a lot of money. And it also depends, it also depends on whether you're building it on a system that exists or if you're creating a whole standalone system. So mm -hmm. there's there are some other factors that come into play here, and maybe we could come up with a way to look at both options. Okay, because I would estimate it. Just than that. I, I I would suggest ten million a year for fifteen years, minimum. So so as further background on on this question of money, Curtis. Yeah. I, I just want to throw that that they've asked us to recommend, then pardon my French, but it becomes a fool's errand. If, if, they're, if they're not willing to make a, the full commitment. You know, it's so interesting you're saying this because I remember Eitan's compelling testimony um, in front of multiple committees talking about putting money behind this. It was so compelling. And I so I think, Curtis, you make a really good point. You know, there are, and I'm not going to even attempt to repeat what you said, Aton, but it was such incredible testimony. And it really brought home the importance of doing this work and doing it correctly and funding it correctly. Um, and I, I think maybe we need to bring that to the forefront again, and maybe that needs to be part of the report that we send in is is what you said to all those committees because that was um, a really important, powerful piece. 
Well, thank you. And I have it memorized now, so. I bet you do. <laughs> uh, which you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Karen was saying. I, I agree that there's too many missing pieces. Um, and I think the most important piece that I don't know that's been answered is what is being, what are the answers that we're trying, uh, what are the questions that we're trying to answer with this architecture? Because it's like, you know, if we're trying to answer like this small question, it's like, okay, maybe five years. So we're trying to answer this. It's like, okay, maybe it's the 15 years. And then, and then that will also dictate how much staff you need. Um, and I agree with Karen, like knowing where, where we stand, if we're building it from scratch, or is, is there a foundation that we need to stand on? That we can stand on, I mean. But I, I, I agree with Curtis that answering the question of cost is going to be really important here. Wichi, can I throw something back at you as a question? Um, oh, God, it just went out of my brain. How, yeah, it's been one of those days. Um, what makes sense to you in terms of a time frame? You mean to build this thing? How, yeah, and, and more than what makes sense to you, um, how would you even going up, go about answering that? Um, I think we need to figure out what it is that we want in order to answer that. Um, all architecture is going to look different um, depending on what it is that you're trying to answer and especially when you want to have the foresight. So like in order to answer that question, we have to like we would have to just like list the stakeholders of like who are who are we um, like what are we trying to answer? Who are we trying to answer it for um, and how much money you got? I feel like those are the three big questions in order to be able to tell you time. What would you do if I, I see you, Rebecca? Let me just finish this because Lord knows it'll disappear in a second. <laughs> um, what What would you do if those questions were something that were diachronic in in terms of their nature? In other words, something that's answered over time that may look one way in April, and the answers may look very different in December because that's kind of more reality than anything else we've been discussing. Uh, I'm gonna be like brutally honest with you, that is scope creep and that will make the, <laughs> make the project fail. That's sort of like my, my, my hard opinion on that. Um, it's like, we, it takes time to develop these things. So like, we wanna know, uh, I think what's important is like, it, it's important to recognize that we don't know what we want in the future. And that's okay. We need to make some guesses, but it's okay not to know. Uh, but we can't say, hey, in April we want this thing, and then we're like trying to build it, and then come fe February or March, they're like, actually, we want this other thing. It's like that is what's going to make this project fail. So we need to make sure that we know what we want by when we want it, and then that's what we're going to do, and we're going to commit to it. And then okay. we can iterate after that. Thank you. Rebecca. I wanted to highlight that in our other report, we identified um, various discretionary decision-making points throughout these two systems, criminal and juvenile justice, as the collection questions we wanted to have answered. And then within that huge, massive uh, number of points identified, we we recognized that wasn't possibly something we could get a, build an answer right away. And so we went within that and did a priority within. What's possible, um, what we may have to do this go around is narrow within that subgroup of previously identified priority. Again, we're not starting from ground zero here. We did so much work on this. And I, I like Eitan that you're centering us to go back to this report and go to the next level, right? So if, if, if this is something that the legislature has already indicated they're pre-approving one exact to staff, roughly speaking, right? And we can estimate what kind of budget that is. Um, you know, this AISP talked about uh, the easier data, what's really hard data to, to go after, right? 
what's what's already publicly available, what's already there, uh, what within like so so this intersection point of where substantively area wise policy wise we can maybe find finesse that that smaller group of high priority and also learn within that group what's the easiest within and then is it that after our experts we consult this summer is the recommendation that we narrow in on one two three four questions that we want to ask get that into our recommendation right and then build up because um you're right like on one level we want to build this right we don't want the enormity of it to make this never get out of the gate. Um, my understanding, again, though, de deference to the experts here on how to do this, that that you that we don't go out asking all these questions. Like I just don't know how many um, and what would be the best questions. Susanna, you've been very elusive. Sometimes your hands up, sometimes it's down. <laughs> Are you, you know, feeling it or like not? Or... I, I got intimidated when Luchi said scope creep because what I was going to say is 100% scope creep. So I took my hand down. Um, this is something you all have already heard me say before, but I just cannot stop this nagging feeling that it will be suggested, it has been suggested um, that this, what we're talking about should be expanded to include more than race. And so I guess what I was going to say now to the group is what responsibility, if any, do we have to consider building something that we believe can be adapted, scaled, expanded, et cetera, understanding where the racial disparities panel and that our obligation is to answer the narrow questions we were asked that are relevant to race, but with the understanding that you know how state government works. It, someone's gonna come to us and say, hey, what about this other thing? And I just wonder if 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 what we're what we end up proposing is too closed of a universe, or if it's cited too narrowly in a place. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's not our problem and not our job, but just trying to plan for later and nobody has to say anything if you don't want to about that. it's just what I've been thinking about no I I actually been thinking about this I have an idea I've had an idea um, I'm like ready to write this in fact um, I was like looking at Rebecca's drawing which doesn't give me a migraine unlike the one that's in our report last year and I want to put in dotted line circles that all have arrows pointing to the central bureau and say, and these are things that might happen later that are gonna be other things. So for those of you who were concerned, senators whose names I won't mention here, um, see, it's, it's like Mr. Potato Head. You can just plug in things whenever you need to. And that will change over time and we fully expect that it will. The only thing I want to also add, Susanna, is that I appreciate your point uh, in terms of too narrow of a focus uh, so, on just race. But, but, but we, um, we, uh, we have in our report in terms of collection area that we wanted to collect was de demographics and within that category we identified so much more. I can't remember everything we identified as something we wanted was beyond race, race, ethnicity, gender, age, class. I forget what else. <laughs> the intersectionality points to really understand the full person, right? It's artificial to just collect on race. It's it's an incomplete picture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we recognize that in our last report, maybe then this process of identifying, prioritizing which questions we want to answer should include what demographic collection points we want to, to answer, to confirm that again. Curtis has a point and then we'll go to Witchy. Okay, so I'm, I am back on this idea. There's nearly a trillion dollars under capital asset management in the state of Vermont. We could, and, and I'm already making the, you know, formulating the pitch in my head, of you know the existential threat to Vermont 
if this work is not done as a selling point to the private sector that they need to capitalize this effort around data collection, analysis, and reporting um, because they have a long-term interest. They're, they're not in the business just for a year or two or three years, but they're looking at a generational timeline. And, and I think we could tap into that generational timeline to say it's in your best interest to commit each of your, your firms $10 million a year for 15 years, which is just a, a, just a, a, a drop in the bucket of their net worth. So I, I, I know the focus is on responding to what the legislature has, has asked, but I'd also like to engage people in thinking about something much broader uh, and substantive because we're gonna, we're gonna be scrapping around for you know, $500,000 from the legislature next year. We couldn't get 50 to pay the community members for this. Yeah. Right, so why, why bother with the state? If you can build it with private funds that understand the existential threat for not doing this work. So I'm going to button it up with that. Witchy. I think Karen was trying to say something before I put my hand up. So I want to check it. Oh. Oh, OK. Just kidding. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to say that I do think, you know, to Sheila's point in the chat, it is really, it is important, and to Susan's comment, obviously, um, it is important to center BIPOC with intersectionality because it's how we're going to see a lot more and a lot deeper. And it, it was even in the package, right, that was given to us that we need to consistently look at intersectionality because we're going to see more patterns, um, be able to identify things more that way. And I think a lot of this and a lot of the creation around this project, around this kind of project, is an exercise of like letting things go. Um, and we're not going to get everything we want. We may in the future, but we really, I, the actually the, the focus and that little box, you want that little box. You want to think about outside the box. You want to think about where you're going in the long term so you don't put yourself into a rut, but you want to do it small because you're going to be able to get the, you're going to be able to get the, the, the result a lot quicker. Um, if you make for, if you go for like smaller projects and then you just build on it like a Mr. Potato Head. I like that analogy. I think it works. <laughs> I'm old. What? <laughs> I. I'm hearing three things for next week. One is. Oh, right, Sheila, Sheila, your <laughs> hand was up and then it went away. Sorry, I, I was like, I don't know. I have trouble doing things. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm in there. I'm not, I'm, I guess, it's, anyway. So I just want to thank you, Richie, for bringing my chats into this space. Um, I just want to say, you know, commenting on what I wrote in the chat, this centering BIPOC with intersectionality and being specific of what I think when I say that is that we have an opportunity to focus um, this around race and race data collection within the intersectionality. So we can still center BIPOC, but center BIPOC and center trans folks and queer folks and poor folks and who are of color and like really do that kind of collection because often we're the ones who disproportionately are not represented or told we can or all these different reasons why the data isn't correct. So I would like to say yes and that yes, let's collect all of that data that everybody's going to seek from us. Great, throw out whatever you want, and then let's center it into BIPOC. That's what I feel like would be a happy medium with that, and I think that would be something really um, phenomenal for our state. And, and that, that might provide what I said earlier, Go ahead. And, and so, so well, you know, that might provide, provide it. what the consequences of the central threat be that if we ignore BIPOC, then, you know, the, the state 
economy will collapse. Our education system will collapse. Our housing and health systems will collapse. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, I love, I love what you said, uh, you know, no, thinking outside of the box, thinking outside of the box. Well, I think this is an option outside of the box. Not that this particular thing is that on, but I'm just thinking, saying that there's, um, I think there are resources to be had with the right pitch. Hey, Tana, I have a comment if there's time. Go for it. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that, I, that I'm hearing and, and scares me a little bit um, is um, this inclusion of other demographic uh, information. And, and, and let me tell you why. Um, that I'm not sure how much we want our government collecting about people who are going through the criminal justice system. Like who in government is going to ask, are you trans? And where in government is that going to stay? Um, and what happens to it? And what if I don't want to answer that question? What if I want to pass or I want the anonymity that I get for just you know, answering gender identity? Um, which again, I will then you know, point, you know, go back to Curtis's earlier point of there are a lot of organizations um, like the Pride Center who would be a better source of information and a safer source of information that should be funded as well to collect the data that you want to make good public policy. So that's my getting really scared that we're gonna be collecting a lot of information within the criminal justice system about people um, to answer questions when maybe it's not the government that ought to be collecting that information. It's a great point, Robin. Thank you for that. Yeah. Sure. I also just want to um, follow up on something on what Curtis has been um, encouraging us to look at. And I think that should stay on the table because I think there's no way that the legislature is gonna fund the enormity of what we're talking about right now. And there may be some additional thinking outside the box that needs to happen around what that looks like. But I think if we want this to move forward in the way we want it to move forward, I think at least keeping that conversation on the table around how this gets funded is a really important piece. I do too. I'm just, I'm of necessity caught because, oh, David, you wanna go? You can keep going anytime, I'll, I'll speak after. Okay. I'm of necessity caught because I, <laughs> I put all my fight into getting Act 65. And so I'm like, okay, we'll answer those questions. So I'm a little like on the train right now, mm -hmm. although I really like everything that's not on the train. I mean, the Starship is way more interesting. Well, and I think, oh, sorry. No, I it, it's way more interesting, but I also feel that what needs to be put forth here is the legislature is behind where they think this may be going. They are behind these questions being answered. Mm -hmm. They are behind pushing this through in this biennium. If this goes roughly in this pattern, in this way, I am not sanguine that it will be so if we come back to them and go, actually, we didn't answer your questions. We're into, we're gonna, we need you to go we, to the public sector, I mean, and the private sector, and we need to, we need to make a challenge here um, to get people to put money in on this because we know y'all ain't gonna fund it. You couldn't fund us. I'm sorry, I'm not letting that go. 
Um, and uh, I, no, but seriously, right? $50,000 we asked for. This is a rounding error in a budget of $7 billion. This is, oh, damn, let's go to Starbucks and get a latte. And they made an issue about it. So if that was an issue, I, I mean, we're going to be, I, I think one of the problems is, I and I found this as well when they were going through all these questions. This was like, the right size this year. Mm -hmm. They could handle this. The minute it got any bigger, they like got nervous. And then we weren't having hearings. We were having discussions that were oddly taped on YouTube. So there were just all sorts of really strange things that happened when it got bigger. So I'm kind of caught right now because I really like the Starship model of like, you know, let's just go to the private sector and like throw it open. But I'm also really aware that the legislators are, there's a limit to what they're going to read. David, can I just take a minute and respond? I don't disagree with you, Aton, at all. At all. I think the questions need to be answered. I think you're on the right train. I think that's what we should be doing here. I just think we should kind of hold what Curtis is talking about, kind of, um, what do they say when you do facilitated meetings, kind of, you know, on the on the paper, on the wall, so that we don't, so that we don't lose that somewhere in the discussion. We just hold it while we do this other work, because if it comes down to it, we can, we know we can go there. And I just don't want to forget that he's mentioned that. And if it comes down to it after the session and they haven't done what we are hoping they're going to do with this, then we can go someplace else with it if it comes down to that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. Thanks, David. Dave. <clears throat> Thanks, Aton. You know, I, was, I was, had a bunch of thoughts, and um, as I was working through them, I realized it may come, my, <laughs> my ultimate takeaway here, I think, comes down to reiterating your uh, agenda point for next week, Aton, which is that we reread our immediately prior report, the report that led to this project, because I think that a bunch of the stuff we're getting at here, a bunch of these ideas that are floating out there, um, could be anchored a little bit more clearly if we trust our own prior work. And in particular, I think that um, we're trying to think about, well, where should the Bureau grow, uh, go? How big should it be? What's the budget there for? Um, I think if we look at question three uh, in the context of our prior report uh, in particular, that may be a nice anchoring point to say, okay, this is what we think the Bureau should do. These are the questions we want the Bureau to be handling. And again, I actually think I keep coming back to the prior report because I think we did a bunch of that work already. And we can use that as a way to say, hey, this is what we already said should be the priority. Maybe our mission then, and I'm just not saying this is what it will be, but maybe one option is our mission is just that we want to see this data collected, the priority data collected that we already identified uh, last year. Um, and then we can bring in people who, and I know we have some of these folks already, we can bring in more as needed, who really know what it means to execute on that, that and tell us a bit about what the staffing is going to look like, it's going to have to look like to actually accomplish that. And then I think that helps us think more clearly about a couple of the other questions as well, uh, including, um, you know, thinking about how to staff it and what kind of budget thing we might be facing. But I think that all, all that is to say is just supporting Aton's uh, point that I actually think going back to that prior report is going to help anchor us and in particular help us focus in on question three, which will help some other dominoes fall. I'm muted. Um, so what I will do, uh, an action item, is tomorrow morning, don't hold me to a time, people. I will send out both the report from December of 2020, and I will send out, again, a link to Act 65 with all these questions. 
And I will resend the email that I sent earlier. I don't remember what day with the link to the article that I'm hoping we will all look at. I will send out those three things. It will be a weighty email. To start working at um, what David has suggested as well. So it's going to be a bunch of reading. You've read a lot of it. Well, you haven't, Witchy, but I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll look and see if I have notes somewhere that I could send you that's, like, directed, because I do that sometimes. But um, I, will, I will send all that out tomorrow morning so that we can get a refresh on all of that. Is that working? I see some nodding. Okay. Other points. Jess, did you have your hand up? No, no. I was trying to turn my camera on so I could give a thumbs up in response to your last. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I, will I unmuted myself on. instead of turning my camera on. I'm very confused. I get confused. I don't know what I'm pushing anymore. Um, I, I, my recommend, I don't know. We have nine minutes left. I feel like we should call it good with this. And um, no, I will send out. Could I, could I just jump in? Because did others, Robin, thanks for sharing that him, that woman, that speaker to uh, the last week on, on yes. what was the yeah. title? That? She was great. I just wanted to make sure we didn't lose that thread before we get deeper. Like, I didn't get there. Did others or you listen to it? Were there points that are relevant for where we are right now in terms of other things Aton should be sending us? <laughs> did she... Um, I, you know, I mean, Aton, so it, uh, it's hard to say. Her history of crime stats, I mean, she, she gave a really great, you know, grounding, I think, on the history of how stats, how, you know, um, administrative data has traditionally left out people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there, the um, move to NIBR, so we have been a NIBRS compliant state since the 1990s. So a lot of what she was talking about was how crime rates are going to go up for a lot of the country because they're going from this one reporting system to the reporting system that we've always been using. Um, so, that's, um, that, so that wouldn't be a concern for us here. But Eitan, what did you think of her or her points or, or anyone else? I, I was rather persuaded by how – I, it wasn't simple. It was there was a certain eloquence to how she wrapped up both the exclusionary process and data be, that's missing. And I was I was rather impressed by that. I don't know what I took from that in terms of an action point, but um, it was illustrative. Yeah. Um, so Rebecca, I can send you the link. So it's up on their YouTube. Uh, it's up, and just to you know, full disclosure here, Haymarket Books is not a um, conservative outlet. Let's just put it that way. Um, you know, uh, they they pub they 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 have a really a, a lot of good um, activists uh, and and activist scholars. Um, so that she's on their um, on their YouTube channel. So I can send the link out for that, so you can watch it. And if people have specific questions about what her points were and how they apply to Vermont neighbors, happy to answer that for anyone. Great, thanks. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Robin. Yep. And Ian just posted that, actually. Okay. I didn't. Ian did. Oh, Ian. Yeah. Yeah. You said I said Ian, Ian just posted okay. the YouTube link. So awesome. why don't we've got some work to do? I will send that out in the morning. Um, and otherwise, I'm gonna just recommend that we close now. 
I think a lot's been thrown out. I think it's uh, not thrown out like in the trash, but up in the air, <laughs> which is good. Um, and a good first meeting. And as I say, we'll send this stuff out. Um, I think David has a good action item in suggesting that we take a look at these documents and then look specifically at question three, what should be the scope of the Bureau's mission? Um, the domino metaphor works, I think, that a lot of other things will fall into place. And yeah, Karen, we got to keep what Curtis put off. I mean, it needs to stay on the table because I, 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 was, I will be honest, I was frightened by sitting in a hearing that was being taped on YouTube and senators were going, you know, I can't support this. It's just about criminal justice and juvenile justice. And I, I just sat there just feeling like a balloon someone had stuck a fork in, you know, like going, what the hell have I been doing? It's called the RDAT. I mean, actually the criminal just criminal and juvenile justice system, you know, advisory panel, and we didn't write about education and you're having an issue. Really? I mean, what the hell? And yet they vote. So um, I, I don't think I'm over that trauma yet. I'll work on that. My triggers are my own responsibility. I understand that. So I will send off all this lovely reading to you fine people at some point tomorrow morning after I've had my tea. And um, we will meet again next week. Thank you all very much for your time. I, again, I know this is inconvenient. I, I, I mean, to say that is just so stupid, but it is inconvenient. And I'm very grateful that you all can make the effort. I'm grateful I can make the effort. Um, we'll get it done. We'll get it done. No matter how negative I get, just slap me. Oh, you can't. We're remote. Oh, well. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Curtis can. Curtis can. He's right there with you. <laughs> so I will send things out in the tonight. morning and we'll go from there. All right. Good discussion, go everybody. Yeah, thank Talk you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.